The next thing we'll look at is the eukaryotic transcription unit, and we want to compare this with what we just saw with prokaryotes. Very similar setup, once again with some subtle differences. So we have a promoter region. Once again, the promoter region is the area where the RNA polymerase comes along, looks for a spot to bind, and when it does, it'll initiate transcription at the plus one site. That's where transcription initiation occurs. So once transcription happens, you're going to end up with a copy, basically an RNA copy, of the DNA that was there. Can you tell me which of these strands of DNA is the coding strand versus the template? Well, the easiest way to do this is to look at which direction transcription is happening. We've shown you here that it's going from left to right. You know that it always goes from its promoter to its terminator, so that makes sense. So the strand that reads 3 to 5 prime in the same direction that transcription is going is the template strand. So that's the bottom strand. This reads from 3 prime to 5 prime. So this strand would be read by the RNA polymerase. And of course, complementary anti-parallel messenger RNA would then be synthesized from its 5 prime to 3 prime end. What does the promoter do? It's pretty much just going to sit there and do nothing. But remember, the, 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 the coding strand is the strand that has, it has the cat box, it has the Tata box. The promoter, the coding strand is the strand uh, that has these promoter elements that we're talking about. I, I know they're drawn down here, but they're actually referring to the sequence that's up on the top coding strand. So each gene is going to be more widely spaced in eukaryotic messenger RNA than it is in, uh, in prokaryotes as well. Why is that? It's because the eukaryotic genome is much bigger, so there, it's spread out, lots of spacer DNA, perhaps enhancer DNA. The other fact is that each gene is going to have its own promoter sequence. Aha, that's different. Just a minute ago, we spoke about polycystronic messages and that more than one gene could be encoded on a single messenger RNA molecule. And all those genes would be encoded from the same promoter. That's not the case for eukaryotes. In eukaryotes, each gene has to have its own promoter. No, in other words, no polycystronic messages in eukaryotes. The other key feature behind eukaryotic transcription is that the information is fragmented into exons and introns. What an exon is, an exon is the expressed part of the gene, whereas the intron is the intervening part of the gene. Notice, on this particular schematic, there's exon sequence, which is interrupted by an intron. What you need to realize is that it's the exon sequences. It's the exon sequences that contain the important protein encoding informations. information. The introns have absolutely nothing to do with the protein sequence. Nothing to do with the protein sequence. So to continue this for transcription, once we, uh, we make a mature messenger RNA molecule, we're going to have, remember, it going from its 5' prime to its 3' prime end. There will be a 5' prime untranslated region, a 3' prime untranslated region, and in between will be some exon intron sequences. Now, before the messenger RNA completely matures, we call it pre-mRNA, pre-mRNA. How do we know this is pre-mRNA? Well, one of the tip-offs is that it still contains the intron sequence. Somewhere before this becomes fully grown, fully mature messenger RNA, that intron is going to need to be removed. It's going to need to be removed. So just to re review some facts about eukaryotic messenger RNA, it's monocystronic. It's monocystronic, meaning only one gene is encoded by each messenger RNA. That's differentiated from prokaryotic messenger RNA. A board favorite is to ask you about maturation of eukaryotic messenger RNA. There's three maturation steps that have to occur. Number one is capping, number two is polyadenylation, and number three is splicing. Okay, so these events have to occur while the, the mRNA is maturing. 
The third fact about eukaryotic message RNA is that there's no coupling of transcription and translation. In fact, transcription happens within the nucleus. The message RNA has to leave the nucleus and go out into the cytoplasm. And when that happens, then it's going to get translated into a protein. So there's no coupling. The mRNA is completely made in the nucleus. It goes out into the cytoplasm where it gets translated by the ribosomes. So let's talk a minute about the maturation of messenger RNA. First of all, the splicing. You end up with the pre-mRNA, which is also sometimes called a primary transcript. A primary transcript is simply, you took the DNA template strand, it was read from three to five prime by the RNA polymerase, and an mRNA was synthesized in its five prime to three prime direction. That's that's a pre-mRNA, or you could also say it's a primary transcript. But it's not mature messenger RNA yet. So in order for our mRNA to mature, the introns have to be spliced out. They have to be spliced out. They also, the mRNA has to be capped. There has to be a cap placed on the five prime end of the messenger RNA. And finally, there has to be a poly A tail placed at the three prime end of the messenger RNA. So those three maturation steps need to occur. So now we have continuation of this, and now the mRNA has been capped. The cap is called a 7-methylguanosine cap. This 7-methylguanosine cap is added co-transcriptionally. So at the same time that this messenger RNA is still being made, the cap is already going to be added to the messenger RNA. A cap. What's this 7-methylguanosine cap all about? It's very unique. As a matter of fact, this triphosphate linkage, which links the the guanosine that's been methylated to the 5' end of the messenger RNA, this is about the only place you'll ever see that specific linkage. And that's an unusual linkage, and it helps provide protection for the messenger RNA. You should think of the the, uh, cap of messenger RNA like a football helmet, right? It's going to protect that messenger RNA from getting damaged, from getting brain damage, from getting concussions, all right? So that messenger RNA is protected by the cap. The other thing the cap is going to do is to identify this RNA species as messenger RNA in the same way that a football helmet is going to identify which team you play for. So the cap of messenger RNA uh, protects the mRNA and it identifies that as mRNA and not ribosomal or transfer RNA. So what that means is, later on, when the ribosome binds to the mRNA, it's going to translate this information into a protein. So looking at the structure, we first had capping of the mRNA. Remember, we're also going to have splicing out eventually of the introns, and then we're going to get addition of a bunch of A's to the three prime end of the messenger RNA. Why do we waste energy adding a bunch of A's? Number one, it's going to provide protection, just like the cap did. And number two, it's going to help the messenger RNA get out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm where it will get translated into a protein. So those are the the functions behind the poly A tail. Incidentally, the poly A tail is added post-transcriptionally. So only after transcription is complete can the poly A tail be added whereas the cap was added co-transcriptionally. And there's some debate as to whether or not the splicing happens co-transcriptionally or post-transcriptionally. You wouldn't be asked about that. In fact, there's a special organelle, if you want to think of it that way. It's more like a, a complex of proteins. It's called a spliceosome. And the spliceosome is going to come together. It's going to cleave the five prime splice site of the intron it's going to cleave the three prime splice site. And in the end, the exons are going to be linked together. The intron is spliced out, forms a lariat structure, and there now you have a more mature messenger RNA. As I had said, there's some debate as to whether or not splicing happens post-transcriptionally or co-transcriptionally. You need not worry about this. Certainly some splicing does happen co-transcriptionally, but most of it's probably going to happen post-transcriptionally. So this lariat structure, if you ever read a case discussing lariat structures, well, that's something having to do with splicing. 
removing the introns from the messenger RNA molecule. And the job of the spliceosome, it, it is the job of the spliceosome to accomplish this task. This introduces us to another type of RNA, and this is snRNA. What does snRNA stand for? It stands for small nuclear RNA. And along with small nuclear RNA and proteins called, my favorite word, SNRPs, which are SNRNP proteins, small nuclear ribonuclear proteins, SNRNA and SNRNPs come together, they form the spliceosome, and they accomplish this task of removing the intron from the messenger RNA molecule. Remember, this happens within the nucleus. Eventually, the messenger RNA goes out into the cytoplasm to be translated. This is what the mature messenger RNA molecule would look like. It's now ready for translation. It's been capped, it's been polyadenylated, and it's been efficiently spliced. The exons have been linked together. So, now at this point, the ribosome is going to be free to bind to the messenger RNA to initiate translation. So in order to do that, the ribosome is going to look for this 7-methylguanosine cap. It's going to look for that cap. It's going to then look for the star codon. It's going to take this coding region where these exons were linked together and translate this into, hopefully, a functional protein. Hopefully a functional protein will now be produced. So you've gone from DNA, transcription's taken it to RNA, and now translation's going to take it to proteins.